Uh, let's uh, let's uh, move on from that. Um, well, we've been going through Nehemiah, and uh, now we are in chapter six, and um, this is where it gets hot uh, on Nehemiah. Now, do you ever give advice to other people? Yeah. People come to you and they ask for advice. Uh, They uh, want to learn from your experience, your wisdom, your knowledge. You know, what I found is giving advice is sometimes too easy. Especially for a pastor, it becomes an occupational hazard. Oh, thank you, girls. There. My handler's in the back. (laughs) And uh, I'm going to turn this off. So that don't cause you any squelching. Um, anyway, because it's so easy sitting in the comfort of being an advisor to say, yeah, do this, do that, okay? But you know, I have found that if you're the one who's asking for the advice, you're the one that's needing the advice, sometimes it's so difficult, you know, personally. Because, yes, knowledge-wise, this may be the best course. But, you know, emotionally, you may not be equipped. You may not be ready. Uh, Timing-wise, it might not be right. There may be factors that the person who's giving the advice just doesn't understand. You know, this stuff is personal. And when it gets personal, it is very hard. So I have learned to be very gentle with my advice. And I will say this. When we talk about the Bible, the principles are in there. But the application from any principle can be many. And the timing and the appropriateness is something you need to let God guide you on. I can give a general application, but it may not be applicable for you. You're not in that stage of life. Uh, Your situation may be a little different. And so you need to bring your wisdom and you need to seek God's guidance. And so um, this is kind of what's going to be happening today. We're going to learn some general guidance about how to handle pressure. Uh, What's been happening is... Nehemiah has been leading the rebuilding of the wall. At this point, they've more than half finished. And, you know, because the enemies of Judah have not been able to stop him, the building, now they make it personal. They're going to come after Nehemiah directly. So this whole chapter is wave after wave of attack on this guy who had just come less than two months from the court in Susa. And he is facing things. And we're going to find that though they cause him to bend, he does not break. And these things that cause him to bend that we're going to see in this chapter may not be the same pressures that you're going through. But whatever they are, they will cause you to bend. And the way he handles them may not apply the same way to each one of the pressures that he's in there, but what they do is they give him an overall strength so that he does not break. And so if we learn about these things, we too can be strong and not be those who will break. Because what are we building? We're not building walls. We're building a community and a nation. What are we doing here? We're not building a building. We're building a congregation that's going to be steadfast and immovable, strong in the Lord, more than conquerors. Read and post it somewhere that he says, good people worship at Mandarin Baptist Church. And I like that. You know, his opinion of us Uh, We share that about one another. And we want good people to become even better people. And that's what we're talking about here. Okay? So uh, follow along. And I'm going to read the uh, the, the chapter uh, to emphasize the uh, portions of it so that uh, you will see when I come back to the various points, the uh, verses 
that brought this out for me, all right? So turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 6, and we're going to read through the whole thing and cover the four pressures that he goes through, the four waves of attack. And I'm going to have to read it from mine because I've got it underlined, but you can follow from the screen. Verse 1, Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall, and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors in the gates. Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, and let us meet together at Hakaparim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. Underscore. Well, you know, maybe Nehemiah had watched some of the gangster movies, or he was an HBO subscriber and watching Game of Thrones. But he knew better, right? Don't go to the meet, because if you go to the meet, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, so he does not sit down. Back in the old days, we say, you sit down for a powwow, right? Well, the pow is going to be on you, okay? And so he doesn't go and uh, what he does in verse 3, and I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. So they says, come, meet us at, oh no. And Nehemiah's response is what? Oh, no! It's an old pastoral joke, okay? <laughs> anyway, um, so they want to bring him to this place of danger, and they use pressure, the pressure of public opinion, okay? Uh, they're saying, we want peace negotiation, but you don't, and they were going to use the pressure of public opinion to make him look unreasonable. And, you know, he doesn't vary. All four times... He just flatly refuses. Uh, he doesn't want to go, even though he could have arranged for his safety. You know why he doesn't want to go? He doesn't even want to talk about it. Because if you are going to go into a meeting like this, you're going to have to compromise. You are going to have to do what all the other leaders, well, I shouldn't say all the other leaders, but every level of leadership from Judah had already done. The rich, the priests, the prophets, the powerful, had all compromised. We're going to see that through the rest of Nehemiah because they were going along to get along. And so they had compromised and they had conformed. They had even allowed some of their children to intermarry with the Gentile children. And so uh, he knew that if he sat down, this would be the outcome. And so he doesn't even bother to meet with them. And this is the first pressure that he has to fight off, compromising conformity. And, you know, I, I find this very relevant because right now, as never before, we all are getting pressure to conform. Remember how bad it was when you were a teenager, right, to fit in with your friends? Well, now it's not just a teen movie problem. A friend of mine went to China to do business. He said it was a custom at every level, he found, that you had to grease the wheels of commerce. And he said, what am I to do, Pastor Ken? You know, this is the way things are done. I've got the pressure of the whole nation to work against, and I need to do business here. That's why my company sent me. I'm against bribes, but what can I do? And, you know, not to make it into a China thing. Let me give you an example from church, all right? This UCLA student who had been from Calexico came to Los Angeles. And she was so thrilled to be in the big city and in a big school. And uh, so she was energetic in the fellowship, in the college fellowship. She was naturally friendly and outgoing, and it was just her custom to welcome everybody. Then she says, I couldn't believe it, Pastor Karen. I started to get the message, stop 
being so friendly. Okay? We have our inner circle. We have our in-group. And we don't want you, because you're a part of it, to break our little holy huddle. Wow. And so she was torn. Do I stay with my group or do I go with my values and my personality? So it's a real problem. Romans 12 says we are not to conform. We are also told that we are in the world, but we're not of the world. Right now, for us as Christians, we're getting a lot of pressure to conform, aren't we? The world is telling us on so many levels, as the Bible says, to call as right that which is wrong. And they use words like, tolerance. And they say, you Christians should be more loving, you know, and they ignore the fact that it is the Christians who do more charitable work than everybody. But they say, we are intolerant. And what are we going to do? Well, we just can't go along. We're told by the Bible to keep love and truth always together. 1 Corinthians 13.6. I want us to take a quick look at it because this is so important. 1 Corinthians 13.6. And it's talking about love. And it says, It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Okay? And so you never pit the one against the other. You must find ways to make them harmonize. And so we must love, but we can't allow wrong. You know, I grew up and I, t- I was taught this saying, hate the sin, but love the sinner. And as I've been in churches for all these decades, you know what I found is the problem? We're good at hating the sin, but we're not as good at loving the sinner. Okay? We're too hard on each other. We're too hard on ourselves. And we're especially too hard for those in the world who need to know that God forgives and loves. And so if we were to do more of that, I think that they would have to shut their mouth when they want us to compromise. And so we have this problem. And sometimes we're very susceptible and vulnerable to compromise. We feel this pressure most powerfully when we're under these circumstances, as I've observed from many years of pastoral work. When we are alone, we're especially susceptible. Or we might not be alone, but we just feel lonely. We will go along to get along. Or when we're new, like my UCLA friend, or when we're having a hard time in our lives and we just don't have the energy to take on more pressure. Or when we are unsure of ourselves, we don't know the Bible well enough, we haven't really taken those values to heart, or when we're just young and inexperienced. And so it's easy for us to identify with the pressure that Nehemiah is going through. The second thing that he experiences is a personal reputation defensiveness. Now, that sounds like a $2 word, but it isn't, all right? You just get defensive about yourself, okay? Our president and every president gets a lot of this kind of pressure, right? Everywhere he turns, there is disagreement, criticism, or attack. And this is not a political statement at all. What does he do in the middle of the night? He tweets. <laughs> he tweets his responses. And this has happened so frequently that his closest advisors are worried that he is not going to get the positive things that he can do because he's just too busy tweeting and defending himself. Now, let me ask you, if this can happen to someone who is this powerful, this rich, this well-known, has this many advisors, if he's vulnerable, you think I'm vulnerable, you think you're vulnerable, you can bet we are. 
And so Nehemiah faces this attack on his name, his reputation, his image, his honor. Let's start back at verse 5, continuing to read. It says, in the same way, sent Ballad for the fifth time. Okay, so he's already called him to meet four times. So this is a continuation of what he's been doing. All right, that's why we need to read the Bible carefully to notice the details. So for the fifth time, he sent his servant to me with what? An open letter in his hand. How obvious is this? Okay, so he sends him an open letter. In it was written, it is reported among the nations. And even Geshem also says it. You know, Geshem says it. it's got to be true, right? Anyway, a bunch of things. A, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. rebel. <laughs> I don't know what they'd do if they rebuke. Anyway, intend to rebel. Number two, and that's why you're building the wall. Number three, according to the reports, you wish to become what? Their king. Concerning, um, and then finally in verse seven, and you have also even set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah. Now they start to pretend to be worried about him. They're pretending to be his friends. And now the king will hear of these reports. So now come, let us take counsel together. Okay? They want to buddy up to him. They're still trying to get him to meet. Still pretending to be his friends. But you know what? Uh, they uh, are not going to be successful. Verse 8, Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say has been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. And then he confides, For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work, and it will not be done. That's an expression talking about discouragement. And so he prays, and now, but now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. And you're going to see the word afraid and frightened several times in this chapter. That's the whole underlying tone of this campaign. And so it can happen to a president. It can happen to us. The third pressure that comes on him is to use improper means toward proper ends, okay? To say the ends justifies the means, and the Bible says no. Righteousness has got to be all along, not just at the end. And so, starting at verse 10, and it's a little hard, and that's why I gave it to you right at the beginning. Follow along and see uh, how this develops, all right? Now, when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, okay? Shemaiah is a priest, and he comes to Nehemiah and says he has a word from God for him. He comes from a prominent family line, and that's why it's listed here. Um, so I was merciful because I didn't make you read that line. But if I wanted to get everybody to wake up, I would have had you try to read those names, <laughs> okay? He said... Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. So they've given up trying to lure him. They are going to invade in some way. In effect, what Shammai is doing is this. He says, now they are going to try to come here to kill you, but I've got a clever idea. Come with me to the temple grounds and hide with me in the inner temple where only the priest can go. And only then at selected times and certain priests, one at a time. They'll never think to look for us there because nobody's supposed to come in except the priests and at certain times. So they would never suspect. It's okay, I'll let you in. You come with me, I'm a priest. Okay? This is going to be how we save your life. Proper ends, but in improper means. And so Nehemiah thinks about, this is his conclusion, verse 11. But I said, 
Should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. See, a lot of times people look at this and they say, wow, he's got a lot of personal courage. But he ties it in with the fact that it's wrong, that a man like him, a lay person, is not permitted to go into that part of the temple. And so he is very aware. And then he gets this insight from God after he comes to that conclusion, verse 12. And I understood and I saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced, Shemaiah had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Verse 13, for this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid, there's that word again, and act in this way, and what? And sin. Serious stuff. If he had gone in, he would have sinned, and, you know, it would have been so tempting, since, after all, he could have rationalized, God, I'm serving you. God, I'm doing your will. God, it's essential that I survive so we can finally finish building these walls. And it would have been so easy, this rationalization. And this has been the downfall of so many good people. Once I was talking with the chairman of the philosophy department of USC, and we were talking about one of the very well-known pastors in Southern California. And I says, how could this happen? And he says, well, you know what happens, Ken. Okay, when the head of the department talks, you listen. <laughs> says, what happens is these guys do so much good that they think they deserve it. They think that they've got it coming to them, that sometimes they even think that the rules may not apply to them. And it's happened to presidents who practice infidelity, CEOs who steal from the company. It's happened to people who have done great things. And so it's a true danger, and we can always rationalize it away. But here's what Nehemiah realizes, verse 13. And I would act this way, and I would sin, and then... They could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Well, we've seen from before, he's not worried about being taunted, but what he knows is that this will really erode his leadership and the work he's trying to do. They wanted to destroy his power to influence. He's been influencing by his goodness and his godliness. And they want to sabotage that. And so once again, as before, Nehemiah's response is to pray. Just like he did in verse 9. Verse 14, he says, God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, according to the things they did. Okay? <laughs> Pretty safe. He didn't get angry. He wasn't going to waste any emotional energy. But he says, God, you take care of this. Pretty uh, useful. And then he goes on. And also the prophetess, Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. Do you see the vastness now of the conspiracy that's all around him? The pressure is far more than what the tip of the iceberg reveals. And so now we know even the prophets, even the priests, as well as the noble people and the wealthy that we found out about in chapter 4. Uh, but... Nehemiah resists. In verse 15 and 16, here's the result, okay? So, the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elu in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and felt greatly in their own esteem. Now, instead of Nehemiah being afraid, they become afraid. And they are the one whose image has fallen, for they perceive that this work had been accomplished 
with the help of our God. I mean, this is really well composed. He repeats a lot of these words to tie themes together, to really give you a sense of the overall impact. Oh, I've been looking at the clock, and it kept saying 12 o'clock. <laughs> okay, this is not going to work. I have one more pressure to go before we can go to the resolution. Okay, um, they warned me the clock wasn't working, and I don't know why I kept looking at it. I got too absorbed into the sermon. <laughs> okay, the fourth thing that they throw at him is this, all right? So you would think the chapter would end at verse 17, uh, 16, right? Success. Well, let's get to verse 17. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound to him by oath, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara, and his son Jehohahan had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, as his wife. You know, you ever need to clear your throat? Go to that name, Jehohahan. Okay, and it'll clear your throat and get rid of whatever you need to get rid of. Uh, verse 19, also they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. He would not stop. And that's so true to life, right? The pressure does not abate. It just keeps coming and coming and coming and Nehemiah must feel like he's in a long, dark tunnel waiting for the light to show. They're going to keep putting pressure on Nehemiah, hoping he's going to buckle and turn and run back to Susa or just give up. It wouldn't stop even after the main battle was over. They were going to try to get the pickings just like vultures. And so... They were going to keep this up. And you know how long they're going to keep this up? 11 years and 10 plus months. That's a pretty long haul. And then when he comes back a second time, same old thing. You know, that's the problem of this life. Jesus said long ago to his followers in John 16, 33, these things, these things about problems, I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. That is, lean on me like we were singing, and you're going to have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. And so, to bring it to a premature close before the second half, uh, let me ask you, what kind of pressure are you the most susceptible to? Um, and, and I'm going to review the four that we mentioned, but think for yourself what it is that you're most susceptible to. Are you the kind of person who's most susceptible to compromising and conforming? You know, if you're a people person, you are. Okay? Their desires their requests will get to you. And like I said, there are certain times in our lives that we are very susceptible. Or maybe this is something that's very easy for you to overcome. Uh, how about the need to protect your image, your name, who you are, what people think of you? It could be a real distraction in our lives. Uh, the third one, to do the right thing but in the wrong way, to cut corners, to cheat, you know, to get it done regardless. Or are you the kind of person who's good for the emergency, but it's the everyday drip, 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 drip of life that drives you nuts. This was Moses, okay? When there was a disaster, he was great. But those guys kept saying, as he led those millions through the wilderness, are we there yet? Are we there yet? How long is this trip going to take? Are we there yet? What are we going to have today? I'm tired. I'm thirsty. I want some meat. 
And finally, he got angry, right? And he struck the rock. And he found himself in trouble with God. So, or is there something else that didn't come up in this chapter? We need to know our vulnerabilities so that we can find the scriptures that will help us and we can go to God and get the help that he needs. Let me just share this verse with you. Um, in closing, all right. Psalm 46, 1. I'll wait for uh, Cameron to get it up. We're going to look at the first part of verse 2 also, all right? It says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. God is right there. God is right here. God is right in the middle of your problem. And if you know that, look at the first part of verse 2. Therefore, we will not fear. How about that? All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Then we're going to transition to our time of communion.